time. Uh, my name is Eva Slowecki. I'm the Executive Director of the Canadian Society for International Health and the co-chair of the Canada chapter of Women in Global Health. You'll hear from my uh, coach, from the other co-chair of Women in Global Health uh, Canada chapter later towards um, the end of the presentation. But um, right now, as we get started, as we gather virtually, I want to start by acknowledging each of the Indigenous nations whose traditional and unceded territory we are gathered upon today. Here in Canada, where, here in Ottawa, where I am based out of, I want to acknowledge that I am on traditional Algonquin Anishinaabe territory. We acknowledge this land not only in thanks to the Indigenous communities who have been the keepers of this land for generations, but also in recognition of the historical and ongoing legacy of colonialism. This past week, we learned of the discovery of the remains of 215 children at a residential school in Kamloops, BC. I want to just take a moment to recognize the tragic and heartbreaking devastation that the Canadian residential school has inflicted on so many. We must not only acknowledge this dark stain on Canada's history, but recognize that this history unfolds daily in current living and the, and the communal harm that occurred in these schools continues to have devastating impacts on in Indigenous families and communities today. So please take a moment to consider and honor the memory of the 215 Indigenous children of the Kamloops Residential School and also all those others that we know have been affected and continue to be impacted by the residential school system. So thank you for taking this time to think about this and I encourage you to also consider your own lands on which you live. So as we work towards creating more equitable spaces and act in allyship with others, let's also be committed to learning more about how we can move forward in the spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. One of the key champions of collaboration and inclusivity, diversity, is um, our event facilitator, Muriel Maxing. I'm really excited that Muriel has agreed to moderate this discussion today. She has been active in the Women in Global Health movement as the co-lead of the first Francophone list of 200 plus women leaders in global health in 2018, and has been a co-founding member of the Women in Global Health Canada chapter since 2020. Currently, she is completing her PhD in public health at the University, de Mar de University of Montreal, examining the relationships among legislation, health policy, and the utilization of sexual and reproductive health services by people with disabilities in post-conflict Northern Uganda. Muriel is, um, is, uh, is, is a wonderful uh, team member and collaborator, and I'm really pleased to pass the floor to, to Muriel and so that she can introduce our um, exemplary speakers. Thank you very much. Muriel, thank over you. to you. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Eva, and good afternoon, everybody. It's um, my great pleasure to introduce to you our first uh, guest speaker, Anne Killing. She's a British uh, citizen whose 40 year career in global health and social development has included posts in Pakistan, Papua New Guinea, Indonesia, the Caribbean, Belgium, UK, uh, her home country, and also USA. She's currently the chair of the NGO Age International and senior fellow of Women in Global Health. We're so excited to have Anne with us today to provide insight on the Gender Equal Health and Care Work Initiative. It's a global partnership between the World Health Organization, the Government of France, and Women in Global Health. Over to you, Anne. Thank you. Thank you, Muriel. And thank you to Women in Global Health Canada for inviting me to speak about the Gender Equal Health and Care Workforce Initiative. Uh, no time to lose. Next slide, please. And this is the graphic that you will see accompanying this initiative. And next slide, please. So I want to give you a quick overview um, of this initiative. It was launched in February this year by France, Women in Global Health and WHO. 
Um, and we are asking governments, international organizations, foundations, NGOs to give commitments. And I'll talk about those later. Um, on the 1st of July, there will be a high level meeting hosted by the government of France at the Gender Equality Forum in Paris. Um, and I, I think this initiative builds on two things that are happening this year, um, are, are very many things that are happening this year, but the designation of 2021 as the year of health and care workers in recognition of the extraordinary um, contribution of health workers in the pandemic. And secondly, the Generation Equality Forums to mark the 1995 Beijing Women's Conference on Gender Equality. Um, so those are really the you know, background drivers. Um, there's strong political support for this initiative. It was included in two of the World Health Assembly resolutions last week. Um, and the initiative will report to the UN General Assembly in September 2021. Next slide, please. It has four pillars and they are very briefly um, leadership, pay and unpaid work, um, protecting women health workers from harassment and violence in the workplace. And then finally, ensuring safe and decent working conditions. Um, and that includes vaccine equity to make sure that uh, all health workers are vaccinated against COVID and also ensuring that women health workers and care workers get the personal protective equipment, the PPE that they need and that fits women's bodies. Next slide, please. Um, the problem that we're addressing here is not new, um, but we think the time is right to really push forward on gender equity in the health, health and care workforce this year. Um, under the leadership pillar, for example, we know that 70% of health workers are women, but they hold only 25% of senior posts in health. So there's a leadership gap, and that's been, re and that's been repeated in the pandemic. So Women Global Health uh, Research has found that 85% of national COVID-19 task forces have majority male membership. That's leadership, the leadership gap. In the pay gap, uh, in pay generally, there is a 28% gender pay gap in health, which is higher than most other sectors. But over and above that is the unpaid work that women contribute to health and care. And we see that very, very loud and clear in the pandemic. Women contribute $3 trillion to health every year, but half of that work is unpaid. On the third pillar, violence and harassment of women and healthcare workers is very common. That's by their colleagues, by male patients, and by the male community, to the point that many female health workers say they just perceive it as usual. And fourthly, on ensuring safe and decent work, um, we find that in many contexts, medical PPE is not a good fit for women's bodies. It exposes them to infection. Uh, it leaves them working in un undignified conditions because it's modeled on the male body. So these are not new problems, but they have been exposed by the pandemic. Next slide, please. We're asking um, governments, international organizations, NGOs, etc., as I said, to make ambitious commitments that will really move the needle um, on one, or all of these four pillars. For example, on leadership, we're asking organizations to set targets to reach gender parity and leadership. Under pay, um, we're asking health systems, governments with women in unpaid health systems roles to move those women into, into the formal labor market. Under sexual harassment, we're asking governments to ratify and implement the new convention being launched in June. That's ILO 190, which is the first dedicated convention on sexual harassment and violence in the workplace. And on that, that safe and decent work pillar, um, we're launching a global survey on PPE to find out exactly what the extent of the issue is on, on women's access to PPE that is designed for women and fits them. Next slide, please. And if we can make a difference in all of these four pillars, if we can work towards a gender equal health and care workforce, 
the payoff, the dividend is enormous. And we speak of this as the triple gender dividend. The first dividend is that women will come forward and they will fill the millions of vacant health and care worker jobs. We know there are 18 million jobs that must be filled by 2030 just to achieve universal health coverage in low middle income countries. Women will fill those jobs, they'll stay in the profession if we enable them to do so. But at the moment we know that many health workers, many women are exhausted and they're thinking of leaving. The second dividend, if we get this right, um, is that, for example, by moving those women from the unpaid sector, informal sector, into the formal sector, women will get formal sector jobs, income, security, benefits, and that's the gender dividend. And the final dividend is the development dividend, that if we do this, if, if we invest in a strong and equal health and care workforce, then the new jobs that are created will drive economic growth. So basically women deliver healthcare to 5 billion people globally. And this is everybody's business. We all have an interest in a gender equal health and care workforce. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anne, for this uh, very important introduction. Our next second guest speaker is Dr. Beverly Issue. She is a global health system researcher and also a health economist. She is currently an associate professor of global health for the Institute of Health Policy, Management and Evaluation at the Dalan Lana School of Public Health at the University of Toronto. Over to you, Beverly. Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me okay, Muriel? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, so good morning, everyone. I'm, I'm really delighted to have the opportunity to join this important session. Uh, if I can have my next slide, please. Uh, so I want to start by strongly echoing Anne's opening point about the importance of this window of opportunity that has been created by the recent World Health Assembly resolutions uh, that have called for the protection, safeguarding and investment in the health and care workforce. This resolution, together with 2021 being named the International Year of Health and Care Workers, as well as the upcoming uh, Generation Equality Forum, provide a clear recognition of just how critical health and care workers are to the functioning of resilient and responsive health systems. This has been made abundantly clear through this pandemic. And I, now, as we start to build forward from the pandemic, and work to strengthen health systems, the health and care workforce must be front and center in our planning and our visioning for what's required to ensure that we're better able to meet the current and future population health needs, including for those populations who continue to be left behind by the health system, um, as well as to ensure that our health systems are better prepared for future emergencies and for future pandemics. So with this backdrop, I'd like to raise a few key points to support our discussion on why we need to harness this moment to ensure that any investments made are focused on achieving a gender equal health and care workforce here in Canada. Next slide, please. So the Lancet Commission on Women in Health was a landmark publication that put forth a strong vision for advancing gender equality, including across health sectors. And as part of this report, the commission presented estimates of the significant value of women's contributions to health. When we look globally, you know, 70% of healthcare workers are women and their work accounts for between 60 to 80% of the overall value of, of health sectors. And in 2015, this equated to 4.8% of global world product. product. Together with Felicia Knoll and an amazing team of researchers from Mexico, Peru, China, and the US, we have been working to update the estimate of the value of health work globally, looking at women's contributions to health work in particular, as well as the value of discrimination across health sectors. And these results will be published shortly, but I've selected a few previews to share with you today. I've been, I've been working on the, the Canadian case study and, and leading some of these analyses for this project. Uh, and we're seeing similar trends as the global estimates. Uh, in Canada, women constitute over 80% of the workforce. Their contributions to health in both paid and unpaid work account for 70% of the total value of health work. Uh, 
and the value of women's contributions to health in Canada are double the value of men's health work. Women continue to make outsized contributions to health despite pervasive gender inequities that persist across our health system that continue to disadvantage women and other non-binary individuals. In our work, we have seen that women work more hours and longer hours in health work, but at lower pay for the same work. When we account for this discrimination in the form of a gender wage gap, this adds just over 1% of GDP to the overall value of health. We know from some of Ivy's work, which I believe she'll speak to later on in this session, that women are more likely to experience medical under and unemployment. And so leave medical careers, pursue lower pay specialties and drop down to part-time hours. In addition, women, but mostly racialized women, as well as migrant women, LGBTIQI plus populations and others who experience compounding discrimination are underrepresented in leadership positions across the health system but they are overrepresented in lower skilled, lower wage and less secure work. For example, a recent survey from a Toronto long-term care home showed more than 94% of personal support workers and nurses are racialized women. Another study from Montreal showed 80% of aides working in long-term care facilities were racialized women. We contrast this with less than 2% of top health leadership positions have ever been held by a racialized woman in Canada. The, the contrast is, 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 um, is glaring. So we continue to see that women carry a disproportionate share of unpaid work in Canada. Two thirds of all unpaid hours are done by women and they spend two to three times more hours per week doing unpaid health work compared to men. This work provides significant subsidies to healthcare, social systems and to global health more generally. And it continues to be unrecognized and undervalued which in turn under recognizes and undervalues women. Next slide please. So there is no doubt that gender transformative changes need to be at the core of any effort to safeguard, protect and invest in healthcare and the healthcare workforce here in Canada. We completed a policy analysis in the months just prior to the onset of the pandemic early last year on the gaps and opportunities for leading gender transformative changes that would better support women engaged in health and care work help women to establish an appropriate balance between work and life and create opportunities for advancement. The findings from that review, which were featured in part in a blog written for Women in Global Health Canada in the fall of last year, remain highly relevant to the discussion that we're having today. Based on the review, we called for targeted gender sensitive labor protection policies to advocate and support employed caregivers, proactive workplace policies that accommodate the complex roles that women play, the need to accelerate strategies to ensure women progress to leadership roles within health sectors, but also to create meaningful pathways and pipelines for a diversity of women to enter, remain and excel in leadership across the health sector and to secure and expand universal health coverage for better health outcomes among women. While I don't have time to go through each of these recommendations in detail, I anticipate that they will come up throughout our discussion today. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna end with this reminder that women are motors of economic growth and produce the majority of paid and unpaid health work, subsidizing economies. Yet we continue to see that health systems, including here at home in Canada, are disabling instead of enabling to women. And so as an important starting point, one of the key recommendations from the Lancet Commission on Women in Health in 2015 was to count, value and invest in women. And this remains relevant today going into this discussion. Given the size of the health sector in Canada and the number of women and non-binary individuals who provide health work, harnessing this opportunity to advance gender transformative changes for healthcare workers will strengthen gender equality and will ensure more equitable, fair and sustainable health and care economies, as well as a fairer society. This will also allow the health sector as a large employer of, of women to be an exemplar for other sectors. Thank you. Thank you so much. Merci uh, Beverly for, for this great uh, presentation. Our next uh, guest speaker is Nathalie Pombrun. She's uh, the advocacy and policy advisor for the National Aboriginal Council of Midwives. And she's also currently a board member of Grand Challenges Canada with a cross appointment to the Indigenous Innovation Council. From 2018 to 2020, Ms. Pombrun also served as the first Indigenous President of the Canadian Association Midwives. A vous la parole. 
Merci beaucoup. Thank you to Women in Global Health Canada for inviting me today to speak um, to the World Health Organization's Gender Equal Health and Care Workforce Initiative and what it looks like in the Canadian context. Um, I'd like to just start by acknowledging the land where I was born and I am today. I live on Treaty 1 territory in the southern centre of our country on the unceded lands of the Anishinaabe Cree, or Decree, Dene and uh, Dakota peoples and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. I'm a proud Franco-Manitoban Métis midwife living in my ancestral settlement of the Red River. Given my experiences and responsibilities in midwifery practice and leadership, I hope to share a little bit of an inclusive and intersectional um, approach uh, today and to wake us all up into action. I want to thank um, the organizers for acknowledging um, the cultural genocide that Indigenous people uh, live and continue to live here in Canada. I'm grieving and I'm angry, and so I need to share this with you because it's highly relevant to equity. And I think that uh, residential schools and Indian day schools are not a dark chapter of Canada's history. They're a symptom of a much larger disease, uh, which has many forms and names, racism, colonialism, profit over people, imperialism, superiority complexes, and these diseases are still active today and they hurt us all. And they impact the lands, the water, and the beings that continue to, uh, they occupy the lands, the waters, and the beings they continue to occupy and oppress. And we have to talk about these ongoing systems of oppression including the child welfare system, the justice system, the healthcare system, the prison system, extractive industries and racist policies that perpetuate inequity and injustice and prevent healing and reconciliation in our country. These truths are not easy to hear, but they're essential to growing up our collective consciousness, enabling healing, relationship building and moving forward in a good way. So I'll continue to tell the truth to work with an uplifting and strength-based approach and energy, leaning towards solutions, healing and togetherness. Since I started my work as a midwife, I've been involved in professional association building as a way to create social change. What I've come to know is that Indigenous midwives play an active role in protection and strengthening of Indigenous women and gender diverse people and their newborns and families in the restoration of our matrilineal teachings and in raising up our life givers to their powerful roles as center, center poles of our community. We can't talk about addressing gender injustice without tackling all other forms of oppression. I am certain that this perspective is key to addressing the slow and uneven progress we have seen with gender equality across the globe and why a quarter of a century after the Beijing Platform for Action was adopted in 1995, no country in the world has achieved gender equality. Having a broader view of equity, one that is intersectional, allows us to build an inclusive framework, a strong movement that addresses and solves overlapping forms of discrimination simultaneously. Seeing these links are essential as we imagine our post-COVID reality and allows efforts and solutions and gains to be mutually reinforcing. Today I'll be sharing um, on midwifery and Indigenous midwifery in Canada and how we're moving that needle closer to gender equality. I'll be focusing on two action pathways um, that are improving the lives of women and gender diverse people, starting with our historic pay equity case um, that has highlighted the need to recognize midwives worldwide for their work and continuing by articulating the importance of workforce diversity and leadership as an essential tool to improving inclusive health care, shared prosperity, and a key to reducing violence and racism in the Canadian healthcare system. 
Canadian midwifery is a profession that emerged out of activism. In the 35 years since midwifery was regulated, midwives have remained committed to a range of social justice movements, defending reproductive rights, standing up against gender-based discrimination. Pay equity is a fundamental human right guaranteed by the Human Rights Code and the Pay Equity Act. As an almost exclusive female profession providing women and trans-centered healthcare midwives had experienced a gender penalty in their pay for more than two decades. In 2013, the Association of Ontario Midwives filed an application with the Human Rights Tribunal of Ontario, claiming that the province had continuously and systemically set a discriminatory compensation structure for midwives. <clears throat> and so, um, in this, this process took quite some time, but in February 19, 2020, the landmark legal decision um, that was that the Human Rights Tribunal of Ontario ordered the Ford government to take concrete ans- uh, action to end the gender pay gap for midwives uh, experienced as a result of the Ministry of Health's discriminatory actions. The Ontario government filed for a judicial review of the HRTO ruling, which was heard in the divisional court. And in June, 2020, the divisional court ruled unanimously to uphold the decision of the HRTO. This historic win sets a precedence to change compensation practices, not only for midwives, but for all workers in gender professions. We've seen nurse practitioners um, utilize this uh, case and New Zealand midwives to gain to this game to close the gender pay gap. And while it's a victory, the process also highlighted areas of concerns and different actions that were needed. The case was a microscope into Canadian culture and what we value in society. Why don't we value a women dominated profession caring for women, for women's health issues? This trifecta gender inequity certainly compounds the path to equity. What evidence base do we use to value the work? The midwifery profession remains misunderstood and is seen as threatening as we begin to decentralize the power away from physicians. It's disappointing to have to fight this hard just to get a drop in the bucket. We need to to be resourced organizationally and financially and that type of advocacy and justice is not accessible to all particularly to more marginalized groups. It highlighted a country-wide, I think for midwives, it, I, it, it really centered this need that our fights couldn't be fragmented. We have just over 2000 midwives across our country. We can't afford to leave anyone behind. And this has made us better able to understand the issues at hand and find solutions that are inclusive. And this leads me to my second example of gender uh, equality being led by the National Aboriginal Council of Midwives that is centering the growth of Indigenous midwifery primary health workforce. Imagine what health and care workers could do if they didn't have to face discrimination, harassment and violence in the workplace. Imagine our ability to contribute to the systemic change that is needed to move the needle of equity. Imagine what this culture could do to create, uh, what this group of people could do to create a cultural safety that is desperately needed to close the gaps in Indigenous women's and newborns' health in our country. Sadly, we don't collect any race or gender-based disaggregated data across Canada yet, and so many of these uh, pieces remain uh, to be Uh, collected and like seen as transparent truths. But what we do see is that back home in the Arctic, Inuit midwives are the leaders of of the maternity. They protect their communities and help lessen the impact of COVID-19 on families. Inuit led models of midwifery are culturally appropriate and have excellent clinical outcomes. And the model encompasses education closer to community. 
and linking traditional and medical ways of knowing. However, it remains largely unrecognized and unseen. The significant contributions of Indigenous, that Indigenous midwives make day in and day out is not known to most Canadians and policymakers. Systemic racism is rampant in the healthcare system, especially against Indigenous peoples. We need a more compassionate and thoughtful system that recognizes the important role that Indigenous medical professionals play as clinicians, educators, and mentors. So there's just a real need to invest um, in Indigenous-led community-based education programs um, and in diversifying our health workforce um, in order to achieve equity, um, be it gender equity. Um, and so um, midwifery is really leading that way and Indigenous midwives do a lot more than just catch babies. Um, they provide an opportunity for our children to be born on our land, in our communities, with a sense of place and pride. And it's about our families and communities and creating future generations of healthy people. Thank you very much, uh, Natalie, for, for this uh, very insightful and uh, thought-provoking presentation. Our next uh, guest speaker is Mike Villeneuve. He's the Chief Executive Officer of the Canadian Nurses Association with decades of experience on the front line of nursing and in the policy sphere. In 2017, he authored Public Policy and Canadian Nursing, Lessons Learned from the Field and he is a fellow of the American Academy of Nursing. Over to you. Thanks very much, Muriel, and thanks everyone for including us. Can you hear me okay, Muriel? Yes, perfect. Brilliant, thank you. I'm also speaking to you from the ancestral unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe in what settlers call Eastern Ontario and where I live a ridiculously privileged life. And I wanna thank you, Natalie, for your beautiful comments about our national pain today. I think we also um, need to, while we remember children, not forget that there's a very troubling commission of inquiry going on in Quebec about the treatment of an adult Indigenous woman, Mrs. Eshaquan, by uh, healthcare providers. So the, the violence very sadly continues. I have been in healthcare since 1978 and as working as an RN since 1983. And I, I feel uh, I was thinking of that woman who used to say, you are the weakest link, goodbye. Because I don't think I have the kind of knowledge and expertise that measures up to the rest of the panel. But I do want to share with you some observations as a person who has been the odd in the odd position of almost always being the minority and, and, and being a white male minority. It's, so it's, and very privileged, by the way, not, not in a negative way, but it's given me a chance to reflect a little bit over the years. Uh, some of you will have heard me say before that I've always worked for women supervisors. I never had a male supervisor that I can remember. And I, so I never questioned that women had a lot of power and influence and great leadership skills. I was frankly scared of quite a few, <laughs> quite a few of them. And so as I've, as I've watched um, conversations change over, you know, over these four decades about women and power and so on, it's always in the back of my mind that I, I just feel like I've had a slightly different experience. I can see the societal level experience, but some of mine has been different and, and very positive. Uh, nursing obviously remains heavily dominated by women, about 92% of the 440,000 regulated nurses in Canada are women, and there are more than 27 million nurses globally, and, and the vast majority being female. And in most countries, that nursing workforce will be the most, uh, the best educated sort of large group of professional women in, in the country. Certainly here in Canada, the current generation of nurses is the best educated in our history. And, um, but you wouldn't always know that based on the way they are deployed. And it has served and continues to serve a lot of employers very well 
for, I'm, now I'm going to be careful how I'm saying this, but I'm saying it on purpose. The girls, women, to keep their heads down and their mouths shut and just get the work done, right? And what we, we're always saying, you've got to look up and out. You can't, if you're always down, you're not going to be able to be involved in disruption, complaining, whistleblowing, all this, you know, reporting racism and so on. Uh, and so nurses in the main have not been encouraged to speak that way. Uh, I want to thank those who raised diversity as an issue because I can certainly tell you that the entry level of nursing looks very much the, like the country that we serve. Uh, although that's anecdotal, because of course, as Natalie just said, we don't collect any data on that. Uh, we've been asking for that, by the way, since 2000, when I started in policy work. So 21 years, asking regulators just to ask what people's background is, but no. The original reasoning, by the way, was that it took too, it, the paper was already too long, because it was a paper form, and they couldn't put anything more on it. So honest to God, <laughs> here we are with a computer form and still fighting the fight. We don't know really what, um, what the leadership looks like, but I can tell you anecdotally that the further you step away from the emergency room and the critical care unit, the less white are likely the people to be. The leaders are likely to be almost always in all cases men. And in the, the most difficult jobs in the industry, are likely to be occupied by women and often new immigrant or racialized women. Um, I wanna share a couple of reflections coming out of the pandemic that I think are emblematic of some of what I've observed just as a, an, in the unusual role I'm in uh, in this profession. Um, I, my view is, and maybe others already think this, I've never seen any kind of crisis that was this gendered in my entire life. It just seems to be, have played out very, very heavily on the backs of uh, women, certainly in, in, um, in nursing. We had our eyes in, in wave one, including me, very firmly focused on critical care units so that we didn't repeat Madrid and Italy and New York, and, and rightly so, we didn't want that horror show. But we missed this unbelievable brush fire in long-term care. And it, it has been for many years the most outdated, unsexy, poorly funded sector in our health system, managed and run nearly entirely by women, often racialized women. And in many cases, we've taken patients who would have been in geriatric wards 20 years ago in hospitals, in acute hospitals, a very different kind of staffing and simply move that care out, highly complex, frail people into nursing home and long-term care settings where in, in many places, there's only one registered nurse in the building and many, many, many patients being cared for by the absolutely least well-educated, unregulated people in the industry. Not bad people, I'm not saying that at all, but we've turned very complex care to people who and we had plenty of evidence, weren't ready to take that on and certainly weren't supported to. We've had uh, 25 years of research uh, showing that uh, very credible science by people like Carol Estabrooks and Gail Donner and right across the country, uh, really no action has been taken. This is research in long-term care, the kind of structures you need to have, the kinds of salaries and staffing and so on, virtually no action. The army went into Quebec and Ontario and a few days later wrote a report about the same conditions that Carol Estabrook's been talking about for 25 years. And there's an inquiry started in both provinces almost immediately. So when the army men went in and spoke to other men, politicians, action was taken. I, 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 I was sort of staggered. It's like I thought I couldn't believe as I watched that play out. I thought, really, is this is 2020? This is where we're at. Um, to roll out the vaccine program in Ontario, the um, government chose an our retired army general, who I'm sure is a very nice fellow and very good at setting up field hospitals in Afghanistan, but not spectacularly good at rolling out a vaccine program. And uh, I might have thought you might ask a public health nurse you know, or even a public health doctor, but a, but a nurse. Nope, men, army, and the 
I, I have to say, I find the vaccine rollout in Ontario has been epically awful. Um, not all because of him. So finally, uh, let me just, I, I know we have to watch our time and I don't want to wade into a doctor's versus nurse's rabbit hole, but I have a couple of observations. If you looked at the traditional media across the country, who's speaking for pub, the public health response to COVID, would you know that two thirds of all public health services in this country are delivered by nurses, almost entirely women? The voice of the public health of public health is a doctor voice, credible, no part problem with that, but not the only view. And in long-term care, which is after all nursing care, like they're not all lined up there for surgery, it's long-term daily supportive nursing care the voices of the pandemic regarding long-term care, despite all of our efforts at CNA to wade in, has been nearly all male physicians who work in acute care. And they feel completely unable to talk about PSW staffing, nurse staffing. And I just think I, I wouldn't be caught dead if an interviewer asked me to talk about doctor staffing. I say, talk to the doctors, because I just wouldn't want to get myself into that position they don't seem to feel similarly inclined. Second last comment, in when all this was going on, the made the medical assistance in dying uh, issue arose again because of the tranche on decision in, in Quebec. I can tell you there are only two made providers in the country, doctors and nurses, and the Justice Committee in Parliament was quite prepared to go ahead and have it study and not invite nurses. So I don't have many breakdowns, but I had a mini one and said, you have to talk to us because we provide this service. So we got invited to the parliament, the committee in the House of Commons, and oh, suddenly they seem to have something to say. Well, then we're in the Senate the next day. But unless you're there pushing and pushing and pushing, there is an ongoing disparity that I have yet to unpack which is about doc power, nurses power, given that physicians are basically 50% women now. It hasn't really changed it. My time's probably done, right, Muriel? Oh, there you are, you're looking. I was warned if you appeared, I saw I was looking at the other screen. <laughs> okay, let me end there and we can take some questions later. Thank you very, very much for including CNA. Thank you so much, Mike, for highlighting the nursing expertise and also uh, the experience uh, from, from the field. Our last speaker, but not the least, is uh, Dr. Ivy uh, Bourgeau. She is a professor in the School of Sociological and Anthropological Studies at the University of Ottawa, and she also holds the university research chair in Gender, Diversity, and the Professions. She is the director of the Canadian Health Workforce Network and co-lead of the Empowering Women Leaders in Health Initiative. Over to you, Ivy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Muriel, and thank you to Women in Global Health for um, the invitation. Um, I do have slides, and, uh, and thank you. Um, so I want to speak to um, the Gender and Healthcare Workforce Initiative. I will focus primarily on uh, leadership um, initiatives. So if you can go to the next slide, um, I, like my colleagues, would like to um, acknowledge that I come to you in, from the territory known as, as Ottawa, the NCAA territory the Algonquin Anabi Nation, and to acknowledge that land acknowledgement is only one small part of uh, disrupting uh, the system of erasure and, and uh, colonial structures. I want to call attention to sort of three main issues that I will speak about uh, in uh, my talk, uh, elements of the calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. We are coming upon the second anniversary of the National Inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women. And, uh, and I will every day until there is an announcement made call on all, all, all governments to find the graves of the stolen and murdered Indigenous children uh, that we've heard about. Next slide, please. So although I'll be speaking about, um, sorry, if you can click a few just to make sure it's all there. Um, if you, you um, will focus on uh, issues around leadership and I draw some inspiration from this report uh, from Women in Global Health delivered by women led by men of which one of the elements is leadership. 
And uh, Beverly has already noted that women are over 80% of the Canadian health workforce. Um, those are the workforces that we count. We don't count uh, anyone in the personal support workforce. Um, but we can't really tell how many are in senior leadership roles. So it's very difficult for us to attend that. This chart is of women's proportion uh, in, the, uh, in the health workforce, which is growing. That's the yellow line, uh, the green line being men in health and the Canadian labor force in general in red. So the health workforce is growing. It's growing more female. And unfortunately, we don't capture uh, gender uh, in leadership diversity. And I want to also speak to this notion that uh, we really do need to get beyond just a binary focus on gender, uh, but we can't even get to that. Um, in addition to, um, as colleagues have already mentioned, Natalie and Beverly and Mike, we don't collect any data on Indigenous identity, on racialization, so it's absolutely impossible for us to address some of the calls to action if we don't have appropriate measures. And this is something that needs to change. Next slide, please. So although a lot has been made of women's role in uh, the labor force, uh, in leadership uh, during the pandemic, um, I actually contradicted um, this issue in regards to in regards to uh, decision-making tables. And again, because we don't capture these data, it's almost impossible uh, for us to say who's where. So this was an argument about the missing voice of women in COVID decision-making. And in the next slide, I enumerate uh, what I was able to capture, and that is simply by combing through um, different websites. So we can go to the next slide, please. So who's at the decision-making table around uh, COVID? Who do we see on the nightly news? In addition to um, the medical experts, um, I will uh, concur with, with Mike in that regard. We have one woman premier, and as you know, our prime minister is male as well. Our ministers of health, there are four, including the federal minister of health, Patty Haidu. The deputy ministers of health, there are five. And medical officers of health, although so much has been made about how many women medical officers of health there are, there are exactly half. So seven out of the 14 um, jurisdictions. And so these are only the visible people. These are the people that one can find vis-a-vis -vis, uh, websites. We don't capture um, any of these data. So if we can go to the next website. For, sorry, the next slide. Um, the epitome of the lack of gender diversity is in the case of academic medicine. So pictured here are the eight female deans of faculties of medicine in the history of Canada. That's not today, that's ever. And so right now you have at the table four, and it's important to note there are 17 medical schools, one seven. And so this is a particular problem. How did I find out this information? Literally combed through websites and concurred with folks. This is not information that is captured anywhere. So in the next slide, colleagues and I um, were invited to, to produce a piece around advancing gender equity in medicine for the Canadian Medical Association Journal. And the key points of this article um, published earlier this year is that gender inequity persists in medicine and medical academia in Canada, particularly in leadership, as we noted from the earlier slide. And that greater gender equity has been shown to be better for health policy making and patient care. And I'll expand on that point. And then third, because we are focused on the solution space, we really need to look at evidence-informed, multi-pronged approaches that promote gender equity and medicine and beyond all levels of healthcare uh, and for all um, career stages. So if we go to the next slide, I just want to kind of emphasize um, with this slide, if you could click again, that leadership diversity is not just a human rights issue. 
it's not just uh, a goal of ensuring all people have the same rights and opportunities to participate in leadership positions. It has important implications and there are good data that are emerging in this regard. That innovation and creativity in problem solving and service delivery are expanded by leadership diversity. You have more people with more lived experiences around the table. You have much greater organizational effectiveness and financial performance. And so these are, if you weren't um, encouraged by just the basic equity issue, the implications are critically important. So if we go to the next slide, um, it summarizes a um, article in the Harvard Business Review that summarizes a number of, of pieces that um, have been emerging in the United States about the importance of uh, gender and gender equity. And so the argument here is that discrimination against female doctors in this case hurts patients. But I would extend that argument, although we don't have a research base for this, but I would expect that um, we would find something similar, that the violence and discrimination that are experienced by female nurses, female midwives, other female health professionals also um, hurts patients. So if we go to the next slide for some solutions. Uh, for our piece in the Canadian Medical Association Journal, I'll highlight a few things. First and foremost is the quantification of the gender inequities, and I would say all um, equity, diversity, inclusion inequities. So when we were asked to participate in this panel, we were asked to talk about progress, and I would basically say it's hard to tell because we don't count. And if we don't count, how is that really going to change? So based on that foundation of getting better data, we can move towards behavioral and systemic change. We can look to promote more increased visibility and recognition and representation and the pathways to that, maybe through mentorship, development and sponsorship. You have to actively be there. And my last, Last slide speaks to um, a project uh, that was noted at the outset, uh, the Empowering Women Leaders Initiative. And this was funded by um, Status Women Canada, which is now Women and Gender Equality. And this was to really create a solution space. So we've crafted uh, through this project, evidence-based toolkits, promising practices, to support equity, diversity, and inclusion writ large in health uh, care leadership and in leadership in health sciences. But because this is not just for women to do, we have an ally toolkit for men. What role can and should men play in improving equity, diversity, and inclusion among health leadership? And because it's very important for us not just to focus on the gender, but to look at diversity writ large, we have an ally toolkit in support of diverse women's leadership, Indigenous women, Black women, women of color, women living with disabilities, um, and trans and gender diverse um, leaders, including two-spirit leaders. So these are some links uh, to uh, those toolkits and uh, I welcome comments and questions. Thank you again, Women in, in uh, Global Health Canada for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bourgeau and uh, to all our other panelists uh, that presented today, I will invite you to uh, turn your camera on so that we can start the next session of a discussion with uh, the participants. And I'll invite all participants also to think of uh, questions or comments. I see some are coming already in the Q&A box. Um, also some comments in the, the chat box. But perhaps um, I'll start with the first question to use uh, my privilege as a moderator to, to all of you, in fact. So I think this also speaks to some of the comments uh, from Heather in the chat box in terms of uh, gender. Um, gender is only one aspect of uh, equity. 
the need to be uh, considerations for the complexities and nuances of lived experiences of those with uh, intersecting uh, identities and social determinants that are disadvantages. So do complex issues require these complex solutions or is there a simple starting point for creating more gender equity in Canada? So I don't know who wants to uh, speak first. I see um, Ivy, you're nodding. Perhaps you would like to start. Yeah, um, I think we can start by counting and pushing really hard. Um, I'll put in the chat a call to action that um, many organizations have signed on to, uh, which includes um, counting better um, in healthcare um, and especially um, getting at issues of racialization and Indigenous identity. Um, we cannot move forward on our calls without this um, information, and we have over 50. Um, health organizations who have signed on to and more than 200 um, individuals and we're pressing really, really hard that um, uh, specific attention uh, to health workforce from an explicit uh, uh, intersectional lens is absolutely required. Uh, for there to be a legacy coming out of the out of the pandemic. Um, so uh, counting is foundational and then we build our programs and promising practices from there. Thank you. Uh, Beverly, please. Yeah, so I would, you know, really reinforce the point about counting. I think the gender um, analysis framework that is in place by the federal government is a starting point. But, you know, I think until we have, um, until we, we, we still don't have sufficient data to be able to provide that sort of uh, gender-based analysis of policies and practices in place. And we certain don't, certainly don't have the level of nuance within the data to be able to look at the, the intersectional pieces that, that have been raised um, very well through the, throughout the rest of the talk. So I think the counting piece is, is critically important to understand where we are and, and where we're building from. Um, I, I This question also makes me think about uh, this, this concept that Diane Feingut has put forward around mental models and thinking about the need for mental models to ensure that um, we actually are thinking about gender equity with these intersecting identities and, and the social determinants of health sort of front and center. And I mean, I, I don't think it's simple, but I, I don't think complexity means that we, we can't sort of solve this. So some starting points that for me have been reinforced uh, through COVID is that at a really you know, simple starting point, we need to be able to think about the way our health services are designed to be able to meet people where they are and the way in which our health human resources need to be configured in order to support the diverse needs of the population. And this necessarily entails using human resources differently than the way that we traditionally use them. And I think some of this has been raised nicely um, in some of the opening remarks. Uh, so at a, at a really basic level, you know, task shifting is not a new concept, but I don't know that we've really harnessed it in the way that is necessary to ensure, A, we're getting the most out of uh, the resources we have available, but also ensuring that they meet the needs of populations and the diverse populations that we have within Canada. Um, and, uh, you know, I think there is an untapped potential to make better use of innovations, uh, to deliver care to people. Uh, we never thought that telemedicine would be achievable at this scale in the time frame um, that we've seen through COVID. And so how do we harness some of the um, innovations that have, you know, really been accelerated through COVID and actually ensure that they can be used to address some of the inequities within the population, um, while also addressing, you know, the digital divide that has also become quite apparent uh, in terms of in terms of that solution. I want to make one point though around around gender equity and and I I you know I, I don't think that we can think about it within the confines of our border. So what I you know continue to think about is that our our quest for gender equity within within Canada within our health workforce can't come to the detriment of of um, of gender global gender equity. So you know as we think about the vaccine rollout and the role that Canada has played in you know, over procurement of vaccines, which has been important to ensure high vaccination rates, particularly among healthcare workers within our own country, has meant that in many places in the world, there are you know, less than 0.3% of um, vaccinations have been administered in low and middle income countries. And we know that 
women are the majority of healthcare workers. So it means that not only are healthcare workers not being vaccinated, but but a vast majority of female health work health workers are not being vaccinated through these domestic uh, practices. And so I, you know, I think that while it is critically important for us to be really forward thinking in terms of how we advance gender equity within our own health system, we have to really recognize the potential implications intended or unintended of some of these practices for, for global health equity. Thank you so much. Um, do uh, Natalie or uh, Mike, do you want to uh, add some more thoughts on that? No? So on that note, perhaps I'll start with uh, some of the questions that were asked in the uh, Q&A. Uh, one of the questions are, is related to um, the, the feminist pandemic recovery uh, plans. It's from uh, Jocelyn Clark. Hello, Jocelyn, welcome. Uh, uh, she's um, also uh, asking the question, I think, to you, uh, Beverly, in terms of uh, how are, can we uh, incorporate uh, these issues when we're talking about today and uh, what can we do to advocate for feminist and gender equity principles in these recovery plans? Yeah, no, I mean, I think, um, I think, thank you very much for that question, Jocelyn, and, and welcome, glad to have you here. Um, I think the mainstreaming of feminist ideology has, has, you know, there's, there's, it's been an important driving force into a lot of the progress that we have seen. Um, and we've seen a lot of important results from that. So we have, you know, much more equitable labor market participation rates when we compare Canada to other countries. I mean, of course, there is progress to be made, but I think we have to note that there has been important, important progress. Um, and then there are some frameworks in place. So, and some of which were mentioned through Natalie's um, opening remarks as well. So, you know, in Ontario in 2018, um, Ontario was the first province to implement pay transparency laws, which is, you know, a critical first step in ensuring, um, making a step towards closing the pay gap. New Brunswick has um, a pay equity bureau, which provides us sort of lay, um, some leadership around uh, the gains to be made by addressing the pay gap. There's parental leave um, that's equally available across families. Um, and of course, the recent and quite long overdue announcement of, of plans uh, for universal childcare, uh, which will hopefully be affordable, but I think that also will go a long way in terms of um, supporting greater female labor force participation. So, I mean, I think a lot of this is rooted in feminist ideology, which has um, really uh, been able to penetrate through uh, public policy. And so I think that from my perspective, the advancements that need to be made is to ensure that as we continue to go forward, and I think this was raised in some of the comments that our, our idea about gender equity is not limited to um, well, I'll say it another way, is that we set ourselves up to ensure that we're actually able to bring all women along. And so in part, that goes back to this idea around counting and ensuring we have the data um, available to be able to understand um, where the gains, where the problems are and where the gains are to be made. Um, and, and to ensure that that the, the frameworks that are in place really are supportive of advancing all women. Um, and, and because we, I think we know that the feminist movement has traditionally left racialized women behind and, I, and, and looked at gender with a really um, uh, binary perspective. And so I think we have to actually make sure that we are collecting the information and actually monitoring progress and setting targets that, that delve into the, the reality of the diversity of, of, um, of individuals within the country. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Uh, we have another question from um, uh, a participant. That is saying that it seems to, uh, to, to the person that the discourse on human rights is completely absent from the current initiatives on gender equity and global health. Gender inequalities that we talked about today are not only inequalities that we need to address, but they are also violations of human rights. There are many human rights uh, legislation and mechanisms to address violations, but we're not using them. Why? Uh, perhaps, uh, Natalie, you'd like to uh, first speak to, uh, to this question and perhaps the other panelists. Sure. Um, I think that it's really difficult in part because there are not 
very well account, like the accountability measures, for instance, to like the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People and all, all of the UN anything and everything. If you look at our country's abilities and uh, willingness to disclose and share and contribute um, in terms of accountability, there's we have a very, in Canada, we have a very poor reporting um, with regards to our advancement on some of those pieces. And I think there's just, there is a lack of, uh, you know, short of, of people calling out and, you know, ensuring that this is an important piece, that it, there's like an accountability mechanism that is missing to inform for some of these human rights um, pieces. I feel like, you know, Beverly or Ivy might be able to speak to this a little bit better than me, but that's my first, like, uh, you know, we, we, we have all of these pillars, yet they're, how are we enforcing them? How are we ensuring that we're reporting on them in a good way and in a responsible way? That's not happening right now. It's not just Canada, it's everywhere. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. I'll, I'll just be brief to share that in our formal lobbying work, we often look to, um, you know, what is the standard we're trying to achieve? What is the what is the what is a good outcome for this piece of lobbying, including our work, for example, around the federal budget, and to, just to support what Natalie said, you know, we do look at things like the Declaration of Alma Ata, the Declaration of Astana, uh, the UN Declaration of uh, Human Rights. And it, uh, just to support what you said, Natalie, it's shocking sometimes how little we seem to have paid to attention to some of those very central pillars. So when we go forward saying, I don't know, um, money for uh, primary health care frameworks will you know, deliver better health outcomes for the country. You can't get that conversation on the table, even when you say, well, you signed on last year and said, right, glaze. I'll, I'll turn it to others who, who may have a more informed opinion. Ivy, do you, do you like to add something else? No, Beverly? No, I think the points have been made. I mean, I think this is, I, I would only just add that I think that we have those frameworks in place gives us some li some levers, levers to, to work with. Um, have we worked out how to use them effectively? I think there is still, you know, there's still work to be done. So that's not a great answer. Um, that's not a great answer and, and not to keep coming back to data. But mm -hmm. I, as a researcher, I feel strongly that that's that's part of the push to, to make the case to be able to use some of those existing levers in, that are in place. So. Thank you. Another question that we have from the uh, Q&A box is uh, the following. How do we avoid gender equality efforts from only advancing white women? What considerations need to be taken to ensure the complexities of intersectionality are included and these efforts are truly inclusive of all? Um, so I can I can yeah. speak to that issue. Um, I mean, you have to build them that way from the outset. You have to have that explicitly as one of your objectives. You have to have those as your measured and measurable outcomes. Um, it can't be some. It can't be an afterthought, and uh, and so you have to you have to build that. And um, you know, one of the things that. This, this can create discomfort, but out of discomfort uh, comes much more innovation. And so you don't want everybody to be around the table agreeing with you. You need to have people that have that safety to be able to say something and hopefully to have somebody at the, t at the table to have their backs and to say, I totally agree with that. That may not be my lived experience, but I understand and I agree with that. But you, it, it has to be explicit from the outset. And but if it's invisible, and there's no um, explicit, you know, outcome or accountability for these issues, then it, what happens is what we've seen happening. So, you know, to speak to the issue that that Beverly has raised and I've raised, it, you, we we have to shine the light on it through data. But that's only step one. It's about accountability to change what we find in those data. 
Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I might add yes. to that, um, just to say that, I, I mean, I think back to this idea of mental models is that we need to see this not as a, like a social good, that it requires some revisioning around, about what excellence looks like. So mm -hmm. part of the challenge I think to be overcome is that these routes to increase diversity within, um, within the health workforce, within leadership, um, there, it's, it's, I think there, there can be this feeling that it's, you know, it deeply requires mentorship, that, that, this, that this talent doesn't already exist, when I think, in fact, the talent does exist. And I think we need to understand that excellence perhaps looks different than we have been conceptualizing it. And so I think, I think that's a shift in the way that we think about who we are recruiting um, and who should be sitting around the table and what perspective that brings, because there can be a tendency to see it from a... Uh, that it, it truly requires it requires some level of sponsorship but i think it there there is excellence that exists that doesn't require that level of mentorship and that requires a shift in the way that we recruit a shift in the way that we value diverse perspectives uh, um which you know is above and beyond creating the pathways i think it's actually recognizing that those are legitimate pathways to leadership uh, um within organizations and so maybe a segue to, to another question is, um, to what extent do you think qualifications for leadership are gendered? How can this change? Anyone would like to uh, answer to this question? Mike, Ivy? Yes? Uh, I can, well, I can start. Go ahead, Mike. You know, I was just going to make a couple of very brief comments. Um, I had the um, great privilege of being on the team that redesigned the Master of Nursing Leadership uh, program at the University of Toronto around 2012 and then delivered it. I was part of the team delivering it for the next five years. Um, I, I have to say I, I, can't, I can't, responses to it were gendered, but the stuff that we were teaching to me was pretty generic, strong, based in evidence, what works. Um, so I didn't see the, the, if the question is, you know, are the, are the traits or what is being taught gendered? I don't think so. I was the only male on a team of women, so they may feel differently, but I didn't feel that was the case. However, how people enact it when they're competing for jobs and something, that's a whole other thing where you've got, you got to act more male and be, make tough decisions and stuff that's, you know, you know that history. I, I'll stop there. You probably have something Ivy to add. Yeah, I think what, what I was just going to say really builds on that, um, that one of the things that we've tried to um, emphasize uh, in you know, building on sort of the leads framework is that women uh, should lead from where they are and they should lead in an authentic way. And that, you know, all of these things that we call soft skill, really the most critical skills and, um, and women need to sort of emphasize that they have um, expertise in those areas. And again, but it's not, the onus is not on women necessarily. Uh, it's the system to recognize uh, that those are important leadership skills and recognize them in a way that um, represent them, represents them in positions of authority and decision making, which you know we are still um, significantly lacking in. Thank you. We we have a, a question uh, from Lisa Morgan. She was a recent uh, past director of the Laurentian University School of uh, Midwifery, that has closed in uh, in April. And uh, what she's saying is that uh, they've graduated 20% of all midwives graduates in Canada, and it's the only non-urban bilingual midwifery school in Canada. So um, the school was closed because uh, it could not generate revenue. The fate of the school is a well-financed university in Canada, um, uh, but poorly, and uh, but less well-positioned than other schools globally. So to, um, uh, to, to her view, this is not progress. So what can we do to insist on supporting the education uh, of important, largely female provider caters like midwifery? Anyone would like to take that uh, question? I, I suspect maybe Natalie um, has something to, to say. I will just say that it's an atrocious decision. It's a regressive decision. Um, it makes no sense financially. 
um, because the midwifery program basically paid for itself. Um, it was never meant to be a program to generate revenue. Um, it's very tightly controlled how many numbers of midwives there are. Um, we have one tenth the number of midwives that the UK has. And the UK is constantly noting how they have a shortage of midwives. Um, we are way, way, way behind. To take away an essential midwifery education program uh, makes no sense. We need to establish 50 midwifery education programs all across Canada and in community. We now know what we can do with distance education. We absolutely need to do that. So we absolutely need more. Thank you. No one else? If there is no one else, I'll go to the uh, next question um, from another participant that is writing, meritocracy in the academy reinforces gender and racial inequities. How can we challenge our academic institutions to re redress these inequities? Anyone would like to take, yeah, Mike? Muriel, I'll make a, an initial comment. Um, Canadian Nurses Association has uh, run headlong into this problem, both on the front of treatment of, of Indigenous people, you know, and what, what is the role of nurses in the history of the schools, operating rooms, and so on, but also uh, a huge response around anti-Black racism and, and poor treatment of other people um, who, aren't, who don't have a white privileged background. So we if it's helpful, we have challenged ourselves. I called together the national uh, nursing leader, the group of national nursing leaders, the union educators, the usual suspects, as we say, and we've drafted an initial declaration of intent on acting to combat uh, these issues, one stream indigenous, one stream anti-black racism because people asked, to separ asked us to separate them. And it's, it's some principles, but also some actions that we're gonna deliberately tackle. We, the last year when we had the first class of fellows of the Canadian Academy of Nursing at CNA, it wasn't until the ceremony was over. I'm not part of choosing who's, who, who becomes a fellow, but when the pictures of all 58 people went up, you probably know where I'm going. It was like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. So they're, they're diverse, but they all look white. So within the academy, we challenged them this year, you need to, here's what you have to do for us. And they found 30% of the people, uh, of the fellows coming in are visibly not white, indigenous, black, Asian, so it can be done. But we had to direct that. And I, you may have seen in my comments where we've put, to, we have a, a series of advisors who are indigenous, who spend a quarter each season with us. And upcoming is uh, Carrie Nuku is with us now from, she's the Maori lead in New Zealand. We've got Aline Laflamme in the summer, the Honorable Marie Sinclair in the fall, who spent time with our board, our staff. Like, so it's, it's, an, it's an inside sort of look, but also then they do public lecture and teaching. And the final thing I'll say is we are having a first national summit on racism in nursing and healthcare in November. And one of the challenges that on the table there is how far have you moved the dial? So we're trying to, you know, for a big old institution and look who's leading it, right? I mean, it's not lost on me. <laughs> and the president's a white guy, fluke, first time in 113 years, doesn't matter, bad timing. So um, we're trying our best to, uh, really put the rubber to the road and change the institution just through specific strategies. I don't, I don't know if that helps answer the question. Thank you. And thank you also for sharing the announcement on the chat box so that people can have more details about uh, the upcoming event in November. Um, another very uh, interesting question uh, is the following. How can women in leadership pay forward in identifying the next generation of women leaders to bring them up into leadership roles? Um, so um, this is a question that was paused, posed. Um, who would like to, uh, to answer to, to this one in terms of the next generation uh, of leadership among uh, uh, young, young, young leaders, emerging leaders? Natalie? Sure, thanks. Um, 
I think one of the like most obvious ways uh, is through mentorship and through recognition of, of skills that we see uh, in those future leaders, uh, being able to lift them up. No one, not very many people see themselves as a leader. Um, it, it is often uh, identified like from the outside. And so I think being able to see those things, lifting people up, making them uh, feel that they're up to the challenge. And then I think supporting them on their leadership journey, that mentorship doesn't stop uh, in that moment where they begin to take on those responsibilities. And so um, that ability to support that work, um, to, to uh, help them find their voice and, and their unique messaging, I think it's, it goes a really long way. And I can say that, you know, for a lot of Indigenous communities, that's how uh, we, we see those strengths uh, right when they're children and we start to grow that in them. And, and, and so I think, you know, in and amongst ourselves as colleagues, uh, we can do this for each other and it's, it shouldn't be underestimated. I think there's also, you know, when I compare medicine, um, midwifery and nursing, there's a shocking amount of leadership training that is included in medicine that mm. is not a part of midwifery training and not a part of nursing training. And um, I do think that this is like a critical like pitfall um, for our women dominated professions. Um, I think it, it has not done us a good service in terms of our ability to, to grow leaders. Um, and so it is like a piece that we need to really critically examine um, as part of our education and part of ensuring those future leaders um, are represented within our professions. Thank you. Anyone else would like to react? Yes, Mike? No, I thought I'd share um, just briefly the findings of a study that really shocked me. Uh, so to give context, there's 41,000 nurses out of the 440,000 that identify primarily as a leader in an admin uh, kind of position. So it's 9% of the workforce. It's a lot of people with a lot of influence potentially across the country. In the Bench 2 study in 2019, which looked at doctors, nurses, and then other um, healthcare leaders in the, leaders in the healthcare system, uh, we were well, maybe, maybe I shouldn't have been surprised. Two thirds of nurses and over 80% of docs were in a formal leadership role. More than 50% of respondents who perceived themselves as being leaders had ever had any leadership training at all. And more than 50% of the doctors and nurses had, no, it was higher. Let me give you the right number. 83% of nurses and 70% of doctors had not participated ever in a single minute of leadership development. So, if, and if you look even at our own organization, CNA has 44 specialty groups. We say everything from sperm to worm, from pre-pregnant to post-dead, there's a group. Nothing for management, for leadership, for emerging leaders, nothing. So we created the academy last year. This isn't an advertiser of the academy, but 700 people joined in the first year during COVID. So there's obviously some gap somewhere in nursing at least, but the docs said the same thing as the nurses. Most of them got the job because they were the nicest person and the best clinician. Same thing, same reason I got the job to be the ICU head nurse back in the 90s. Nice guy. God, he's a nice guy. So he surely should be a good manager. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> anyway, I'll stop there, Muriel. I might just Thank add you. one last point. Yes, around go ahead. The, I mean, I, I agree entirely with the points that have been made. I think there's also something to be said for visibility and to be able to... Um, to show, uh, you know, more junior uh, individuals who are coming up that leadership can look different. Uh, and so, you know, that's in part being at speaking events and, and being sort of the, the leaders that are there, um, that are, that rep reflect diversity um, to, to sort of be out there and to, and to provide that sort of role model um, for, for individuals who are, who are, you know, being able to envision themselves in this, um, in this role. So I would say that visibility is quite important. Um, while I strongly agree with mentorship, I do think that there's some dismantling that has to happen within the existing leadership because we can mentor and mentor and mentor, but if those positions are not able to penetrate 
uh, historical views about leadership, then we will continue to hit a glass ceiling, right? Um, and so some of this is changing as leaders, as the as the face of leadership is slowly starting to change, but I don't know that that's happening quick, quickly enough. And so, you know, I think we're kind of coming at it from different ways. There's now, um, you know, a real buy-in for diversity, equity, and inclusion training that's happening across all um, levels of hierarchy within organizations that will start to to work to dismantle some of those ideologies. And and I think that, but that it, it has to work at all levels. It can't just be about bringing those you know at the more junior to, um, and training them up. I think actually we have to start to work to dismantle some of those perceptions among among existing leaders because that provides a, a gateway, if you will, um, which you know has to to see, back to the point I was making earlier, that see excellence and see leadership with a new lens um, and be open to, you know, finding it unacceptable when a short list of applications comes through that is only men. Like, that's not acceptable. We need to go back. So um, that that shouldn't be as hard to do, but I, I think it's worth mentioning. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for this lively conversation and also for all your thoughts and the, the questions and comments from uh, the participants. I'm reminded that we only have a few minutes uh, to close this uh, great uh, panel that we had today. And I'd like to turn um, the, the microphone to uh, Bev Johnson, our co-chair of uh, Global Women in, uh, Global, Woman in uh, Global Health in, uh, sorry, <laughs> Global Women in uh, Global Health Women, um, the, the Canadian chapter. So for her closing uh, remarks, Beverly. Thank you, Muriel. And um, yeah, I would like to thank our five speakers today for their amazing presentations. You know, these are very informative presentations on this key issue of the Gender Equal Health and Care Workforce Initiative. And we heard both global and Canadian perspectives. Muriel, thanks so much for moderating this event. We are now 14 months since the WHO declared COVID-19 to be a pandemic. And it is so appropriate, as was said earlier, that 2021 has been designated the year of the health and care worker, and that women in Global Health Global are advocating with the WHO and the government of France for health and care workers. Our Canadian chapter is less than a year old, and we've had several events, done some advocacy writing together, and been active on social media. We invite you to sign up for our newsletter and join us in this work. Certainly a gap has been identified in today's program and maybe the, our chapter can help out and maybe host some leadership education. Thanks to all the attendees today for joining our presentation today. And I would like to end this program again, honoring the 215 children whose lives were taken at the former Canloops Residential School. Stay well, stay safe, and thank you. Thank you.